right, ready. Yep. Tell us who you are. What do you do? I'm Aaron Ross Powell. I founded libertarianism.org at the Cato Institute and now am writing and podcasting, including hosting the podcast Reimagining Liberty, as well as Reactionary Mind, which is a project of the Unpopulist newsletter. I wasn't really political until I was in college. I was kind of before that in high school, maybe broadly left of center. I went to a lot of punk rock shows in Detroit and so picked up through osmosis a, a general sense of you know, punk rock leftism. But in college, I met friends and became involved, started studying philosophy, and that led to political philosophy. And it was meeting my friend and later Free Thoughts co-host Trevor Burris in a science fiction lit class. He introduced me to both economics, uh, because he said, you're wrong about all this stuff for economic reasons. You should read some intros to economics, and then libertarianism. Um, and it kind of ran from there. I think the, the broad arc after that was I was fairly, I guess I'd call it mainstream, and I wasn't right, but like, mainstream libertarian uh, and sympathetic to the the more fusionist project and then over the last say 10 years have drifted further from that and become more come to see conservatism as as i think the larger threat to liberty uh, and so have dedicated a lot more of my work lately to critiquing critiquing conservatism from a, a radically liberal or libertarian direction about how to answer that. I think before I became really interested in politics, uh, the, only, the only politics I was really listening to was what I was getting through lyrics and the songs. Um, and so I remember thinking that bad religion was pretty great. Um, I liked propaganda. I don't know that I was deeply, like I, I liked the vibe, but I wasn't paying much attention to the, the content. As I became more politically interested, and as I moved into libertarianism, um, actually the first book that really had an impact on me in that direction, which I now, I've not read it since then, and I kind of fear to do so because I would reassess it, uh, was a work by Thomas Sowell. And looking back, I think it was less about the specific features of Sowell's thought as the, as it was more just the clarity of arguments against positions that I had thought were kind of self-evident in the like government and planning sort of direction. From there, though, I think the thinker who had a particularly profound impact on me, and in I guess call it like radicalizing me in in this journey, was uh, the philosopher A. John Simmons. His book *Moral Principles and Political Obligations* is what convinced me that at least philosophical anarchism was correct, that state legitimacy was was a myth, the arguments for it don't hold up, and that we don't actually have an obligation to obey the state simply by its nature as some sort of authority, authoritative organization. From there, it's been it's been kind of a grab bag. Um, a lot of my thinking's been influenced by virtue ethics. Rosalind Hursthouse had a big impact on me and changing the the way that I approach moral questions. And then over the last five or six years, there's been a lot of Eastern philosophy and particularly Buddhist philosophy has, has again colored the way that I approach political questions. At least the way that I use the terms when I'm say was giving talks to interns and trying to talk them out of thinking they had an obligation to obey the law was a philosophical anarchist says state authority is a myth, that, that political obligation is ultimately doesn't exist. You know, we don't have some sort of moral obligation to obey the laws, but there you haven't necessarily committed to abolishing the thing entirely. And so this might be that you kind of have hangups. Like it might be that enforcing illegitimate authority is morally wrong and bad in, in certain ways, but you might believe that the alternative of not having a state could be worse, right? Like if it, if it returned us to a Hobbesian state of nature of our lives are solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short, we might say that the particular wrongs of enforcing illegitimate authority are outweighed by the need to avoid that. 
Um, and that's generally how I approach it, is that you can be a philosophical anarchist, you can think that the state power is illegitimate, but still have reasons to think, given the alternatives on the table for us, acting as if it were legitimate or enforcing it as if it were legitimate is still the right answer. Whereas political anarchism would be saying, okay, smash the state. Like the philosophical, anarch philosophical anarchism is correct. And the, the conclusion we should draw from that is the total removal of, of political power. Um, and I tend to use the philosophical anarchism approach, at least when I'm talking to people, because it's, it's a softer sell, and I think it tees up a lot of the kind of thinking that can lead you to political anarchism, um, but is is like a more palatable initial, I guess, taste of these ideas. I think that we, as human beings, are tuned to hierarchies and and are very good at thinking of ourselves as being positioned in them, and so a lot of authority. I don't want to say that authority doesn't exist because there can be good reasons to say defer judgment to a particular person um, or to provide to at least give the decisions that they make a degree of respect or a a benefit of the doubt and so on um, and so i think where i the kinds of authority that i think we should really shy away from and they they tend though they tend to get reified in this way that we think about hierarchies are those that are violent um, and those that are, I guess, degrading. So I don't think that like if you are a, a student and you have a teacher and that teacher is, that it's, it's a healthy relationship and that teacher has a level of authority in the sense of like they are guiding your learning. I don't think we should abolish that or that seeing that as illegitimate is, um, is all that helpful. I think that where the problem and it's, so I guess, there's not a bright line answer to this question, um, but I think the problem is that we end up convincing ourselves that we owe people who have some degree of authority much more than we actually do, and any degree of authority tends to turn into officiousness or domination, and so it's more of a more of like a virtue approach, I suppose. Of we should. We should cultivate these relationships with each other. There are reasons to heed others' judgment, uh, but they tend to turn toxic if, if not checked or if the wrong type of people are participating in these relationships in the wrong way. And then I think the bigger problem is that so much of the way that authority is structured in, in our society and the way that government encourages us to think about, society, or think about authority incentivizes bad sorts of authoritative relationships as opposed to, I think, what would be more, what would be more healthy ones. Virtue ethics in contrast to strict consequentialism or strict kind of flowchart rule following deontology, I think is just a better picture of the way that we already think about ethics and we already think about morality. It's, you know, there are lots of kinds of virtue ethics, but I think the core idea of it is that rather than trying setting out to answer the question of in any given situation what is the right action the the more helpful and more interesting and more true to just our moral psychology approach is to say what kinds of values beliefs habits preferences and so on traits of character will maximize the likelihood that we will behave in the right way in a given situation um, and then virtue ethics is theorizing out what those traits of character are, what inculcates them, what undermines them, what counts, and so on. But that core idea of rather than just looking at the question of like, what are the right actions, we should be asking, what are the right kind of people? What does it mean to be a good and ethical person living admirably? And then how do we get there? And then the the questions of what to do will kind of fall out from that. The if you're if you're a good person, you're going to do the right thing more often than not. I do identify as a Buddhist, um, but I don't know how much. So I can't. I my politics were fairly formed by the time I turned to Buddhism, 
And so I don't know that Buddhism hasn't redirected my politics. It's more given me a, in my mind, helpful way to think about these issues and to kind of another ethical approach to making the same case, which is basically don't be violent towards each other, don't dominate each other, treat each other with dignity and respect, and also appreciate the the diversity of of all of us. Um, and I think in particular, what Buddhism has at least offered me is what I find to be a pretty persuasive and compelling story of the human condition and particularly why we suffer, why we find our lives unsatisfactory, why they are stressful, and how we, how our reactions to the world outside of us get internalized in, um, in these harmful ways, and how our interactions with others become part of that same story. And then giving a, what I find to be personally a helpful method for addressing that, for kind of getting out of those basically harmful habits, harmful views, harmful beliefs to somewhere that is that is healthier, happier, and happens to be also one where we can live together in a more a more peaceful and respectful way. Yeah, so I had been at Cato for about a year uh, when I started it or when I hatched the idea for it, I suppose. And I was drawn to libertarianism because of the ideas and the philosophy and you know, these these great minds who inspired me. And it wasn't it wasn't the public policy. I knew fairly quickly that I was not going to become a policy wonk. And most of what Cato did was public policy work. And what I thought was this is the most prominent libertarian organization in arguably the world. Uh, a lot of people who are interested in these ideas end up hearing about Cato scholars, coming across Cato's work, and so on. And the libertarianism that Cato represented, I think different than other political positions within, say, within the Beltway, had this largely coherent like philosophical foundation and an intellectual tradition behind it. And those were the ideas that excited me. And so I thought there ought to be a place, like Cato ought to be talking about those ideas, the ideas that motivated the scholars to then do their policy wonkery on the various policy issues. So that was really the motivation. Um, and yeah, and so from there, it was just, it was building out this resource of the core ideas and analysis of them. and and presented in a way that at least I hoped was kind of imagined myself as an undergrad first getting into this stuff. It's like, what is the stuff that I would have wanted to have access to? What are the things I wanted to be listening to? What are the things I wanted to be reading? And how can I build that platform for, you know, like me at that time, 10 or so years, you know, imagining myself 10 years in the past then. I was very young when I started libertarianism.org. Uh, and, and trying to build it out because I think these ideas are are exciting and compelling and engaging. Um, and I wanted there to be a place where they were presented in a way that I thought was principled and true to them. After I left Cato, I had for almost a decade been hosting a weekly podcast called Free Thoughts. And so I wanted to continue doing that. It's a Hosting podcasts is a lot of fun, um, and it's a good excuse to just have interesting conversations with interesting people. So I wanted to continue doing that. But particularly what I wanted to do was have a platform to talk about the case for liberty without essentially decades of fusionist baggage. Um, so libertarianism, particularly as like an institutional movement, had decades ago cozied up to or allied with conservatism for a lot of different reasons, most of them I think not particularly good. And that had influenced the way that libertarians talked about their ideas, 
the where they focused their energy, what sorts of deviations from a strictly libertarian position they were willing to overlook versus consider so beyond the pale that we wouldn't work with these people in other areas. And largely what it meant was it was dragging libertarianism to the right, culturally to the right, politically to the right, and bringing in most, a lot of the people who were being reached out to, young people like we'll bring them into the liberty movement, were coming from the right. And I increasingly came to see this as a, a big problem within the movement. And so reimagining liberty is a place for me to articulate kind of how I have come to think about the case for political and economic and social radical liberty in a way that gets away from all of that. Like I am decidedly not on the right. I am decidedly not conservative. And I think that the message can be more appealing to, it can be made appealing to people on the left because there's shared concerns on the left in a way that I don't think there is really shared concerns on the right. Um, and I wanna talk about that. And I think I, it's, so that's my place to do it, is to try to articulate this, for me at least, like reimagined approach to, to exploring these ideas. Reactionary Mind certainly shares a lot of DNA with Reimagining Liberty and Free Thoughts before that because it is, it's, it's me and it's my ideas. But I think the main difference is where Reimagining Liberty is me trying to articulate and explore and dig into a, the, the positive case for radical freedom, Reactionary Minds is more about the opposition. And so it is, it's a project of the unpopulist, which is a online newsletter critiquing the rise of a liberalism and reactionary minds is it is the podcast aspect of that and so it is about trying to understand the ideas and the people motivating a liberalism on largely on the right also on the left um, to just get a better sense of what we're up against and so whereas yeah whereas Reimagining liberty is my my positive case. Reactionary minds is me trying to say this is these are the people that we that are challenging a challenging political freedom. Fusionism was the idea initially that political liberty was morally correct. It was wrong for the state to be powerful and interventionist and meddle in our lives. And that virtue, if we want to be virtuous people and we want to be good people, that has to be freely chosen. You can't be forced to be virtuous. And so liberty is the, is the common foundation, the necessary topsoil of virtuous lives, virtuous people. But, so that's where you get the libertarian side of it. The conservative side of it came from the idea that but you need some guidance on what virtue is and how to live well. And conservatism and particularly like conservative religious ideas and traditional ways of doing things embodied lessons about what virtue looked like in practice. And so you have the liberty, we're going we're gonna to give you the liberty to develop a virtue, but it's going to be developed in a conservative direction. That's kind of the ideological underpinnings of it. The more practical ones are in the middle of the 20th century, communism was seen as the great threat to, to liberty in America and around the globe. And conservatives were in opposition to communism. Libertarians were in opposition to communism. And so there was a, hey guys, we can work together on this. Like we certainly have some disagreements, but we can at least work together in opposition to communism. And that then kind of stuck, um, that libertarians then spent more time allying with conservatives. The, the fusionist term is we're going to fuse with them. And so this is why you see so many like nominally libertarian people running for office would typically run as a Republican. They wouldn't run as a Democrat, um, allying with libertarian organizations, allying more with right of center than left of center organizations, cultivating donors from among more right of center 
people than among left of center people. And it just has become, it became sticky. Like there's, there's a path dependency here, right? And getting away from this is hard. But I think the effect I mentioned earlier, one of the effects is who you're bringing into the movement. You know, like, so you're talking to young conservative groups, but not really talking to young progressive groups about these ideas, or you're working with the Federalist Society, um, or you're working as a libertarian policy person, you're spending most of your time talking to Republican lawmakers and so on. And this has colored the movement over time. And while the alliance might have worked when Republicans were nominally, you know, at least they spoke in the rhetoric of freedom and they talked as, you know, called themselves classical liberals sometimes, and they were generally in favor of free enterprise, and they talked about the need to scale back government. That's not the case anymore. And the Republicans have certainly, the conservatives have generally repudiated all of the minor libertarian feelings they might once have had. And so it has, it has made it harder for genuine libertarians to make their case because they are now seen, I think, justifiably as members of the right. And given how toxically partisan and tribal our politics have become, that limits who we can speak to, who is willing to approach our ideas with, with sympathy or even just curiosity. Um, and it has blinded a lot of libertarians to real problems among the right and just created kind of structural incentives, again, kind of encouraging to be, to treat conservatives and conservative ideas and Republican lawmakers more with kid gloves than we do those on the left. And in the kind of political realignment that we're seeing, that's a problem. The first thing I think we need to do to combat the far right and the authoritarian aspects of it and the rising authoritarian aspects of it is to be honest about it and to be willing to be willing to like offend our friends if they're part of it or they're encouraging it um to say like no there this these ideas are anathema to everything that we hold to be true and and also to just break away from the cultural connections and the the mood affiliation of it I've, i'm often just discouraged at how many people in the libertarian movement learn about in like call it culture war areas learn about the other side learn about like what the left or the cultural left is up to through primarily right-wing sources you know the number of times people have, everything i know about critical theory came from reading quillette like Quillette is not a good source to learn about critical theory or much of anything as far as ideas on the left. But those are kind of who we're comfortable, who libertarians tend to be comfortable with. And that needs to be broken away from. Um, and I think too, it is, there needs to be a willingness to look past issues of disagreement, to work with people who can be allies against rising authoritarianism. It is really frustrating to me, say, when libertarians will act as if someone like Rand Paul or Thomas Massey is a good ally, and they're happy to work with them, even though, you know, like, we disagree on some stuff, but someone like AOC, who is incredibly aligned with libertarianism on a lot of really important issues, is just an evil lefty because she supports socialized medicine. And I don't support socialized medicine, and I think it would be bad. But if but like if we can work with a Thomas Massey or a Rand Paul on issues, we can certainly work with an AOC on issues. But the legacy of decades of fusionism has so entrenched so many libertarians in the cultural right that they just like are willing to forgive the deviations on one side and not the other. And that's cutting us off from, it's cutting us off from potential allies. And it is also having us cozy up with people who are often part of the problem themselves. So we've talked a lot about what libertarians get wrong. Um, 
should libertarians instead work with the left, center left, progressives, the radical left, um, and yes or no, what lessons can libertarians learn from the left? I think we should work with anyone who we can ally with to advance the cause of freedom. And sometimes that's people we can find who we want to advance it, who want to advance it across the board. Sometimes it's on a particular issue, but we need all of the support we can get. Liberty needs all of the support it can get. So I don't think that we should exclude people because they're on one side of the spectrum versus the other. Um, I also don't think that we should have, we we'll call it like a counter fusionism. I don't think the, if fusionism, if fusionism with the right was a mistake, I don't think that libertarian should fuse with the, we shouldn't join the Democratic Party or fuse with the left, but get out of this this kind of binary thinking. Um, that said, libertarianism and, and and the hardcore movement for liberty has far more affinity with the fundamental ideas motivating the left and historically the left. You know, I mean, the left rose up in opposition to hierarchy to class, to domination, and it has run in all sorts of awful directions frequently, but that motivation is the same one that motivated the early liberty movement, and we should, we should recognize that. And so I think I have friends on the left who I disagree with on lots of particulars, but you can have a real and meaningful conversation about shared ends with them in a way that I'd say I don't think you can with the national conservatives, with the Josh Hawley, with the Donald Trump, who fundamentally aim at a world that is not free um, and is a pretty awful place. And so we have we have developed a habit, we as the liberty movement have developed a habit over decades of sneering at the left, dismissing the left and thinking the right is wrong but basically okay and we need to break that and we need to be willing to talk with them and we need to be willing to explore those those common shared values because i think they're they're genuinely there the fundamental thing that a lot of my friends on the left and i don't mean the market anarchist left, but the more either mainstream kind of democratic left or the more Marxist left is, I don't think that they have an appreciation for what exactly state power entails and the, that this is a system that is fundamentally built upon violence. And so the right frequently, I think the right recognizes the violence inherent in the system and often applauds it. So law and order, bust some heads, punish our enemies, exclude the immigrants, and so on. Like they're, They are okay with the violence. What frustrates me when I talk to a lot of my friends on the left is that they seem to still believe that the state is just us acting in tandem. It's what happens when we get together to work on a shared project. And it's just not. And being either naive or willfully blind about the fact that state action means threatening people with violence or using violence against them allows you or causes you to slip into advocating things that are just deeply corrosive and immoral and I think counter to ultimately leftist ends. You can't build your... The leftist values, I think, are ultimately incompatible with holding a gun to each other's heads, but so many on the left have been tricked into thinking that this is just like community projects. So that is, so there are lots of then policy details that people on the left, you know, policies they advocate, they don't think will work or whatever, but the core thing, the core misunderstanding in my experience, that again, not the anarchist left, but um, their core misunderstanding is just not appreciating that the state is fundamentally an institution for exercising violence against people. I don't vote. I don't think that it is 
we certainly have been oversold on its effectiveness. And definitely when it comes to individuals, you know, like the math is clear that your individual vote has never mattered in any election in your lifetime and, and never will. I also don't think there's necessarily anything wrong with voting. You know, I don't think that I don't tell people they shouldn't vote. I just say that it's, you should not feel obligated to do it. And there is nothing, you've done nothing wrong if you abstain from voting. Voting certainly can, you know, it, you don't want to say voting has no impact because it obviously does. Like elections happen and the outcome of elections matters. But at the same time, I think that we tend to place all of our eggs in the voting basket or see voting as the means for political change. And this is, I think this is harmful for moving things in a positive direction. First, because so much of making the world better is actions that you can take, um, protests you can engage in, advocacy you can do, new solutions you can build, but we have been basically taught that the way that you discharge your share, your duty to others, your civic duty, call it, is through voting. Like if you voted, you've done your part. And, but if your single vote doesn't make, if that vote doesn't make any difference, then you've done nothing with just that. And so I think voting can trick us into ignoring other opportunities for more positive change. But it certainly, in the aggregate, does matter a lot. Those other opportunities, I think, are, there's a lot of things that we can do to make the world a freer place that don't involve effectively begging the state for our freedoms back, that don't involve changing the people in leadership. And one of those is just showing people alternatives. Because I think a lot of the times when people push for political solutions, it's because we've been trained to see we identify a problem and we just assume that the way you fix any social problem you can identify is via government. Pass a law, regulate, something like that. Like government is the way to plug the holes in, in our kind of notion of the perfect society. And so a lot of it, a lot of what ends up manifesting as statism or willingness to embrace government is kind of a failure of the imagination. And it's just, I can't imagine another way of doing this. And so I think one of the most important things that we can do is to try to build examples of those other ways and show them, you know, I mean, so here's a, this is a really trite example um, and it's not a perfect one, but everyone was convinced you needed a heavily regulated taxi cab industry that that was the only way to run taxis. And Uber starts up and is illegal um, and pushes through being illegal and demonstrates to people there's another way that we can handle this. There's another way we can do it. It can be done in like a non-state, non-regulated way. And it worked. And eventually the state gave up on trying to criminalize or maintain the criminalization of Uber because it had become popular. And I think there's a lot of, there are probably examples out there that are more meaningful than that one, but there's a lot of this is just showing people that freedom can work because I think that we just don't think that way. We think that the state is the way to solve problems. And so to the extent that we can find even small scale opportunities to build alternatives, to build alternative institutions, to build alternative methods, to fix with technology what looked like it was a political problem and so on, that's the way that we bring people into being willing to scale this this behemoth back um, is just fixing that failure of the imagination and showing them inspiring stories of what you can accomplish, what people can accomplish when they're free. I think the value of art and particularly narrative is making real and engaging and sympathetic the abstract. You can read a set of philosophical ideas, but when you see them play out in a narrative, they can become 
immediately more engaging and compelling, and you can you can understand them. And I think this is just because we are by nature narrative beings. We are storytelling animals. We love narratives. We look for them everywhere. We try to apply them to events that we come across in the world. They're powerful tools. I remember once a, there was a Cato Institute like little online symposium about Ayn Rand, and someone one of the that I think the initial question was why, what about her ideas made them so popular, or made them resonate with so many people, and there were a couple of opening essays that were about like the you know the nature of the ideas and the particulars of the arguments and that she had latched on and you know like it was so it was like the philosophy is correct was the argument and then i think it was the philosopher michael humer wrote a fairly short follow-up essay where he was like no guys it's because she wrote novels like she put them into she put them into fiction and had she not had she, at all she published was nonfiction, she'd have languished in obscurity no one would be an objectivist today which might or might not be it might be a good thing but i don't know um, but regardless, like the fiction is a powerful way to make this stuff real. We sympathize with characters. Um, I think the other value that it can have is in humanizing, you know, like telling so much of what is wrong with politics and so much of what provokes authoritarian tendencies and populism and liberalism and a desire to use the state to punish and exclude is being scared of difference seeing people who are different from me as a threat that then I need this powerful thing called the state to, to save me from. And fiction is a way for us to start to break down some of those barriers of difference and understand each other. Uh, and it's also just, it's also simply fun, you know, like putting political ideas into fiction is makes them fun because you want to know what happens next. You know, no one reads Rawls really wondering what's going to happen next. It's not a page turner. That said, I think there's a danger in, I don't read a lot of explicitly political fiction. I don't play a lot of explicitly political games. And that's because a lot, most of it is bad. Because if you place the, if your main goal is the politics, so you're writing didactic fiction, it's going to suck. Um, it's going to come across as that's what you're doing. And so this is why, by and large, like conservative filmmaking is pretty terrible is because they really want to make conservative movies. Whereas I think that the Hollywood left is better at making left-wing movies because they just see those ideas as in the water. And so they're just trying to tell a good story and the ideas are along for the ride as opposed to the ideas being central. Um, so fiction, I think, can certainly be powerful if it's done well, but almost every attempt to set out to try to persuade politically through fiction falls flat on its face and probably makes your case worse off than if you had written it just some other way to begin with. Are there any other parting words, closing thoughts, or any items you want to bring up that we didn't cover? All right. Who is why, why do you think it's good that everyone should stop using drugs? 